This morning we've got a very special session. I think arguably any forum that is discussing Australian society and culture should be talking about this issue in one way or another. No one forum can say everything there is to be said about this issue, and today we're focusing not on violence against women as a whole, but on the media's reporting of violence against women, and hoping to say some things about how that's changing, how it needs to change, and the extent of the change. Um, 35 years ago, I was uh, a police rounds reporter, and in those days, before mobile phones and the internet, we used to sit in the old Russell Street Police headquarters and listen to the police scanner. Most of the stuff that came across that scanner was what we would now refer to as domestic violence or violence against women. The tone in the voices on the scanner told you that the police weren't necessarily taking it very seriously, regarded as something of a chore and not their real work. And I remember quite distinctly when remarking upon this to my editor, being told, it happens all the time, therefore it isn't a story. It isn't a news story. It's not news. Well, now, of course, we seem to have had a shift. And the shift is along these lines. It happens all the time. It's a hell of a story. And, of course, it is on any conventional news values. More than one death a week. Extraordinary lost productivity and economic cost. 40% of women who say that they've been on the end of either physical or sexual violence during their life the leading cause of preventable death and disability in women of childbearing age. These are extraordinary statistics. This is an economic story, a crime story, and a social story of enormous proportions. And yet, the research tells us that it has been underreported. And here I should say that the Centre for Advancing Journalism has got a current research project in this and also doing a lot of work with our students trying to look at why there has been a sh an apparent shift in news values, what has caused that, and how deep does it go? Or what long standing can, can we expect it to be of long standing or not? There was some research published in 2012 which identified some of the problems or the issues in the media's reporting up to that date. First of all, sources. People went again and again to the police, who of course are an important and a legitimate source, but very rarely to the survivors of domestic violence, to social workers, to people in the sector who were working with those sides of the issue. Very rarely was the gender basis of violence against women identified in news stories. Very rarely was it reported as an underlying social issue. Rather, it was always, my goodness, he must have snapped. There was a sort of um, it must be a random event and an exceptional event rather than a recognition of it as an ongoing problem. And quite often there was a lack of reporting that there was a relationship between victim and perpetrator. Sometimes, to give the reporters their due, that was due to legal issues such as contempt of court. But there has been an enormous change since 2012 when that research was published. Um, we found that, that um, if you look at The Age and The Herald Sun in this city, there has been a doubling just in numbers of articles since 20, that research was published in late 2012. And of course, now we have a Royal Commission going, it's an election issue, there's been action at federal and state political level. Um, there seems to have been an enormous change. So today we're going to try and talk about what the nature of that change is, why has it happened, and how deep does it go. Um, now just a couple of things I want to say about what we're not trying to do. Uh, we've had some comment already that this is basically a panel of white middle-class women, um, that we don't have uh, cultural diversity on the panel. I'll say two things about that. One is I think that's in part a reflection of the Australian media, which is not to excuse it, but just to contextualise it. Um, also, that we did try to get a bit more diversity on the panel and haven't succeeded, but I certainly think if you look across the new news as a whole, you will find that diversity there. Um, now, I've got some terrific speakers to address this issue with us. Um, first of all, on my left, Vanessa Bourne is the Media Projects Man Manager at Domestic Violence Victoria, which is the peak body for Victorian Family Violence Services. Now, I've known Vanessa for a number of years now, and long before these, this issue was making headlines, she was doing a lot of work in the background, non-glamorous, slow, plodding work, connecting the sector with the media and trying to alter and affect the way that the media reports on women on violence against women. I won't tell you the detail of that. I will we'll leave that to her. 
And sitting on her left, we have Ellen Winnett, who is national political editor of the Herald Sun. Um, she is on this panel because she is the spearhead of the Take a Stand campaign, which the Herald Sun launched in 2013 and which continues to this day and was, I think, one of the main reasons for that enormous lift in the amount of media reporting on violence against women. And then to her left, we have Jane Gilmore, who is the editor of Women's Agenda and has written on this issue for a number of different outlets and will be talking to us about, uh, I gather, the difference between perceptions and reality on this issue. <laughs> Um, we're going to allow some time for questions at the end, which are most welcome, but to start off, I will turn to Vanessa and ask her to talk about her work. Hi. So the work that I've done at DVVIC uh, over the last about five years has focused specifically on media content on the causes of violence against women and what we can do as a community to prevent it. I think we've definitely seen the positive changes that Margaret's talked about. What I think we've seen is more reporting but in terms of quality, I think we've seen the emergence of a discussion of violence against women as a social issue, rather than just as seemingly randomised incidents. And a, a big part of that has been a real increase in the inclusion of evidence and commentary from violence against women specialists. Like Margaret said, not just a reliance on courts or police or commentary from people that knew the victims and perpetrators. And this has been a big change in contextualising the issue for people, and I think it has been huge. And there's definitely more than one driver for this change, and I think that they interact with each other. So from a sector perspective, in the early 2000s, in the Grampians region of Victoria, family violence workers started to work on this area with discrete projects to improve media reporting. These projects were very successful. They expanded statewide and have continued until today, which is close to a decade and a half of very focused work. Um, and it's arguably also globally leading work, and I'll be presenting on these in Europe in about a month's time. So it is work that is quite relevant uh, on a broader scale. What I think has been particularly effective about these projects is that they have not been about one group preaching change. They have specifically looked at bringing together a whole range of stakeholders on this issue from very different professions, getting them to create shared understandings and to troubleshoot solutions to this problem that are relevant to the media industry and also relevant to the other stakeholders on the issue. And I think they've been very influential in some public ways, but also what Margaret said, in a lot of the behind the scenes work that we don't see in driving that dialogue forward. And I'm happy to sort of give some of the details of them a bit later, but I, I think this work very likely would not have been successful without the other drivers that have happened in Victoria. We've had specific journalists really taking this issue on and having a variety of journalists as well as some really big media names has created a lot of momentum um, pushing that dialogue. Online and social media, which is very pertinent to this whole series, um, the New Year series, have really allowed the community to hear different voices and feminist voices on this issue. But importantly, what they've also done is allowed all other media to see that this is an issue that the community are actually really interested in. And as a result, it's, it's very newsworthy. We've had some very public and powerful voices on the issue that have contributed to that. And the obvious examples would be Ken Lay and Rosie Batty, but also sector programs that have worked with women to be able to safely tell their stories more to the media. And those voices together have created content for journalists to be able to report more often on it as well. As much momentous change as we've seen, and it is momentous, a lot of people wouldn't have thought that we would have had this dialogue or seen it in, in their lifetimes. We need to re recognise how massive this issue is and how much change is actually required uh, to solve it, I suppose. I think that we've kick-started a uh, community agreement that this issue is big and that it's um, terrible. But I don't think we still have broad community understanding about what causes it and how we prevent it as a community. And that's little things like all the terminologies and definitions and what they mean and how they interrelate. But more importantly about the role of gender as a key driver for violence against women. 
the role of power and control within that and how that uh, plays out, and how women's identities and life circumstances interact with gender as well as everything else. And the obvious ones would be socioeconomic, racial and cultural identity and how that is treated in Australia, uh, sexuality and physical ability and identities around that and again how they're responded to in our culture, and a recognition that these are not additional issues to violence against women. They are the core parts of how power and control exists, how men who choose to use violence are able to target and are able to abuse women and how that's enabled within our community and therefore what we can do to stop it. So in summary, I think we're seeing in media the start of a very important dialogue and conversation and I think that media can continue to have a powerful role in getting key evidence out to the community on this issue and continuing that dialogue. So I'd like to see us talk about that today, hopefully. Okay. Well, I'm sure we're going to get to all those issues. <laughs> um, but Ellen, I'll turn to you now. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for your interest in, in being here to ask us questions and, and flesh out this issue because it, it has been a really significant change, as Vanessa said, a momentous change, really, over the last couple of years. The, um, the Herald Sun is the largest selling daily newspaper in Australia. We have 1.4 million readers across our print and digital platforms. I've been a journalist for 26 years. I am now the national political editor, but like Margaret, when I was younger, I was a, uh, a police reporter, a police uh, crime reporter. And I've done that full time for about 15 years. And over the years, uh, I, like Margaret, would speak to the police and there would be events and we actually called them a-domestic. They were just a-domestic. Mm -hmm. And we didn't cover them. And um, my experience is not quite the same as Margaret's in that it wasn't because there were so many. It just seemed to be that the view was that it was a private matter. Certainly the police treated it as a private matter. Uh, the media treated it as a private matter. We didn't report it when it happened. We really only reported it when it came to court at its most disastrous level when someone had died or been very, very seriously injured. So there's been a very significant change, obviously, in how we handled that. And in, uh, in 2013, uh, July the 22nd, we launched Take a Stand campaign, um, which was a very big big uh, decision by the Herald Sun to do that. We backed it with seven pages, including launch it on the front page. And to do it, we got male community leaders in because that was the first time the Herald Sun had said, we're going to treat this in a very systemic way. And our aim here is to make this a male issue, not a female issue. Um, Vanessa and people like her knew this um, and have been telling this. And it was time, I think, for the mainstream media, which you know, in Melbourne, the Herald Sun has a very big voice in this field. And so we made it all about the men. So we had uh, powerful men coming out and saying um, what needed to be done. And we also used uh, very sympathetic, um, strong survivors who felt able to be, in a very public way, identified as survivors of family violence to tell their stories. Because for us, it was very much about showing our readers that this affected everybody. Um, it wasn't a feminist issue or it wasn't a niche issue. It, this affects everybody, and we were really pleased to be able to do that. And the other, the other thing we really wanted to do was make it a political issue. And uh, I think about four months before we launched, I went and met some people, including at Domestic Violence Victoria, and I said, I want to make this a political issue. I'm going to get this on the front page. And as a result of, I think, a lot of the Herald Sun's advocacy on that, you've seen here in Victoria the first Royal Commission into Family Violence and the first appointment of a minister for family violence. And of course, um, when Rosie Batty came to all of our attention, she was this gracious, strong, amazing uh, advocate. Uh, I think, to a degree, the environment was, was uh, perfect and people were really ready to listen to someone like Rosie Batty because she spoke for all of us. And so we've been running Take a Stand now for two and a half years. We uh, plan to continue that. We're absolutely committed to that. My editor is a male editor. He's driven us very hard on that. He's extremely interested in it. He understands how important it is. And we look forward to continuing Take a Stand for as long as it takes for us to make a change in this field. Thanks very much, Ellen. And Jane. Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, my work is around domestic violence has mostly been concentrated on, as Margaret said, the difference between perception and reality because I think that's where people in the media can make a difference when we talk about 
what the perception of reality, so what Margaret was talking about before, if it was perceived as a private matter, as my grandmother would have said, you don't wash, hang your dirty laundry out in public, that kind of thing that kept it quiet to what we're doing now where we're saying it is a public matter and now the perception is that it's a public matter. But what we're doing now, I think, um, is we are still distorting the perspective slightly because the problem is the one thing that we don't ever talk about is we actually don't know what the reality is. All the data that we have about domestic violence or any kind of male violence against women is self-reported, is based on surveys. Um, the, most, the one most frequently used is the ABS Personal Safety Survey. And that's the one where everybody quotes the, the myth that one in three victims of domestic violence are men, that one in five women will experience violence. At best, that's an indication um, because it's all self-reported. So the way that survey works is they choose a certain couple of thousand homes and they send somebody in, pick a person in that home at random and ask them about their experiences of violence. The problem with that is um, all perpetrators think of themselves as victims, apart from a very few sociopaths. If you talk to, and frontline people will tell you this all the time, perpetrators think of themselves as victims. So um, she made me do it, she pushed me into it, she knows what I'm like when, when I get angry. And so when you sit somebody down like that and ask them about their experience of violence, they will report themselves as a victim. On the other hand, if you talk to somebody who is actually genuinely a victim of violence, they will think it's their fault, they will think it's something to be ashamed of and something to keep hidden, so they will report that they have no experience of violence. So these self-reported surveys are an indication, but they're not actual information about the extent of domestic violence, or particularly about um, sexual violence, because the one thing that we know about sexual violence that crosses all cultural boundaries, all age, gender, and across history, is that the almost universal experience of that is shame. So because of shame, it's not reported, it's not talked about, people will actually lie about it. And we have this saying on the internet that anecdotes are not data, which I dispute they actually are. They're not statistical data, but they are data. And you talk to anybody with experience in this sector and they will all say that when they do talk to people, the common frame is, oh, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't report it. I was too scared. I was too ashamed. I didn't know what to do. So part of the problem that we have in the media is when we perpetuate this idea that we know what's happening, we're almost perpetuating a myth. We don't know what's happening. We, we think we have some idea of it. All we know, as Margaret said, is that it's drastically underreported and the, the nature of it means that there's not a great deal we can do about that. The one section of data that we have that is actually robust is homicide data because it's not self-reported, it's investigated by police and coroners, it's investigated objectively with evidence. When you look at the homicide data, if that's a reflection of what's happening of the worst end of what's happening in domestic violence, then the gendered nature of it is so stark. Um, New South Wales Coroner's Court released a report into the last 10 years of domestic violence deaths in New South Wales, and it was just absolutely horrific. There were, um, of all the homicides in New South Wales, 17% of male homicides were domestic violence related, 48% of female homicides were domestic violence related. In the entire 10 years, there were 25 men killed by their intimate partners. In not one single case, not one, over the entire 10 years, was a man killed by an abusive female partner. Six men were killed by male partners, 25 men were killed by women, and in every single case, there was evidence that the man was abusing the woman who eventually killed him. These are the things that tell us what happens when domestic violence gets to its absolute worst but we also know that the homicide rate in Australia is very low and that's in fact been declining over the recent years, not increasing as, again, perception looks like because now we're hearing about it yeah. rather than that it's happening more. So I think the role in media is to talk uh, to women about their experiences and say, this is what we think is happening, this is as much as we know, but we also know that this is unreliable. What we need to be able to say more and more is that the extent of sexual violence and domestic violence is far greater than we're actually reporting. So the fact that, that we are able to say to women that this experience happens, it happens to too many of us, that you are not alone and that you are not to blame, I think is the strongest thing that we can do when we're talking about this issue. 
Thanks very much to all of our panellists. Um, I'm just going to ask you a few questions now, which I hope will, will test some of these assumptions. As I, as I told you, we've been doing a lot of research on this, interviewing a lot of journalists, including Ellen and, and her colleagues at the Herald Sun, but also in other media organisations. And one of the questions we've been asking is why? Why the change? Now, most people, of course, mention Rosie Batty and, and Luke Batty's murder, but in fact, that was February 2014, mm. and the lift in quantum had begun before that quite markedly. So while that obviously swelled um, the numbers of articles being published enormously, it certainly wasn't the root cause. Um, other things that most reporters identify are the advocacy of Ken Lay as Chief Commissioner of Police, and also, before him, Christine Nixon, who actually did a lot of work behind the scenes in changing the way the statistics are gathered and the way in which police report this issue. And then we can go on and say, well, now we've got a royal commission and obviously there's reporting of that going on and there have been other issues as well. What if those factors didn't exist? If we assume the police had never given this issue priority, if we assume there was no royal commission and Luke Batty had not been murdered, which, of course, we all wish, would we still be looking at the same quantum lift or not? Ellen, would you like to comment on that? We're talking about a hypothetical, obviously, <laughs> but I'll mm. give it my best shot. Um, we did launch <coughs> Take a Stand in, what, six or seven or eight months before poor mm. Luke was, was killed. Um, you know, as of today, 67 um, women in Australia have been killed by men, most of them at the hands of a family member there's been a body found overnight. That woman's son has been arrested by the police. Um, I really hope that we would have identified that, that pattern. Mm. Um, look, from the Herald Sun's point of view, we have covered family violence over the years and, and there have been specific individual cases that have come through the justice system that we have followed through. Would we have covered it in a systemic way? I'd really like to think that we would have. I feel like... Um, its time had come and also the, I do believe that 20, 15, 20 years ago there was a stigma in people coming out and talking about it. I think people very much feel able now, or much more able to go to the police or go to a support worker and actually talk about it and all of that means it's easier to talk about publicly and therefore in the media. Mm. And what do you think, Jane? Um, I think it's such a combination of complex factors that were you to remove any one of those factors, then all the others would paper over the holes. It's, it's not even just Victoria or Australia, it's international, that um, advocates in the UK and the US have influenced advocates here, um, mm. being given that space that there were what, say, when I first started doing this, um, 2009, 2010, there was a lot more noise from bloggers and from individual advocates that then carried over into the mainstream media. Mm. So I think it was a combination of a lot of different factors and then you had the right person like Ken Lay who made incredible differences to the way police understood domestic violence that in the first three years of um, he, the changes that he made, domestic violence reporting in police went up by over 150%. And that was entirely due to reporting. It wasn't that domestic violence increased by 150%. I don't think it changed at all. Mm. But police were recognising it and recording it as that and he was making such strong efforts to change the way they were perceiving it, which also changed the way journalists were perceiving it, which changed the way the public was perceiving it. So I think it all snowballed and I don't think any one factor really could be removed and change the snowball. Mm. Now, Vanessa, you've been working away at this long before it was making newspaper headlines on a regular basis. What's your percep perception? Um, how deep is this change and would it have happened without these other factors? Look, it's hard to answer. And in saying, yeah, I have been working specifically in this field for five years, but the work that I've done, like I said, has been with a lot of people that have been in the sector a lot longer. And we're talking 30 or 40 years, women that started some of the first refuges. So from working with them, they have been trying to do this for decades and literally hitting walls. And it's not that it hasn't been reported, but it, like you said, it hasn't been reported uh, comparable to what's actually going on and the range of things that are going on. I think that we could have done without one or maybe two of those things and have still seen change, but without all the things you've mentioned, no, I don't think, because mm. that's when I saw change. And change has been very recent. It's been the last two to three years. Mm. Personally, what I saw create the biggest change 
publicly was the murder of Jill Ma. Mm. And from my personal, I mean, I was running a media awards event at that point, the Evers, that awarded media on good reporting, and was getting, it was quite difficult to get through to people, to get them to want to put their entries in, to understand what the awards were about. I saw a really obvious and marked difference when Jill Ma was murdered, and I think it had a lot to do with the fact that she was a member of the media, and I feel like it personalised it for some media. And that's not to say that every change that happened from that point was because of that, but I do feel like it stopped being at this happens all the time to, oh, my goodness, mm. how awful and how real is this Even though that happens. wasn't domestic violence, that was the rare no. case of stranger danger, wasn't it? But it, mm. it brought up that dialogue of women being murdered, women's safety, whose responsibility is it, mm. you know, and it became this discussion as well where we went, oh, this is actually quite rare. It usually happens in the home. I saw the biggest change then and I saw a lot of online and social media commentary about what is this problem of violence against women? What's going on? How should we be talking about it more? Mm. Um, all those other factors though, I think you need public voices. I don't think things get very far when you have women who are already stigmatised and devalued in society saying this is a problem. And like you said, Christine Nixon actually started all of the changes in Victoria Police. Ken Lay did a massive amount, but he's often credited for all of it, which mm. I think is quite interesting. Yeah. And I do think that outsiders or people with the power are often listened to on an issue rather than people advocating for their own group mm. as well. Just, just staying with you for a moment, Vanessa, you talk about the experience of those women running refugees, founding yep. refugees, working <coughs> very hard on this uh, before it attracted major funding mm. or royal commissions mm. or anything of that sort. Can you just tell us what their typical experience would be with the media, going back? Going back? Um, <laughs> look, it was ranging. So there's, there have been really good journalists and really good journalists for a very long time and stories of people that just push this issue again and again and again and get completely stigmatised by it within their own media outlet. So there was a lot of those stories of the fabulous journalists. And then there was a lot of um, negative stories. And I, th I have to say before I say these, I do think media gets the blame for this in a way that's not necessarily proportionate. Uh, I don't think media are to blame about the community dialogue on this issue. I think it's a broader community dialogue and media are simply part of that. And often we can think it's their fault and I don't think it is. But I mean, the worst sort of comments that I've heard is media calling uh, up organisations and saying point blank, have you had any good gang rape stories mm. recently? Could you give me a call when you do? And people just having to <laughs> just hang up the phone and go, what is the world coming to? So there's that. And then there's sort of getting quotes and them being turned into something that's quite dramatic or or just dropped. So spending all of this time away from direct service giving quotes and then the story doesn't run because the journalist wanted it to run but the editor didn't really think it was a story. Mm. So that would be some of them mm. I'd mention. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that there were also good, good practitioners out there before it was uh, a popular topic, if you like. Um, now, all of you have highlighted the gendered nature of violence against women. And of course, if we ask the question, what causes violence against women, it's a complicated one and there are many factors. And I know that all of the bodies that are in the field at the moment, including our watch, are wrestling with how to state those many causal factors. But obviously, gender politics is the underlying one, the big one. How do you cover an issue like that? Obviously, a murder is relatively easy in conventional news terms to cover but as Jane alluded to it's only the the tip of the iceberg it doesn't go to issues of financial control of surveillance including using electronic devices of bullying of verbal abuse all sorts of other things Ellen I'll go to you first then you Jane how do you cover gender politics in a paper like the Herald Sun I think there's two ways that we cover family violence. And we went through this sort of meeting we had with the press council last, last week, two weeks ago. One of them is the sort of reporting of the incident as such, when you go to cover a big event um, and that gets reported. I'd, I'd actually um, say it's not easy because you, you, you have to deal with people who are very traumatised, mm. convince them to talk to you, get their trust, and then treat them with the respect that earns that trust. So on the one hand, that's um, just reporting that brings to people's attention another woman. 
um, then what comes out of that is the more measured um, uh, feature type reporting where you analyse this, which is where I, um, I think Vanessa is talking about where we're getting in more of the commentary from experts, um, survivors, advocates, um, the sector, and I think that's how we do it. And you can uh, obviously there's a fair debate going on at the moment about whether it's just gender politics or whether it's poverty or whether it's uh, um, other issues, cultural issues, those sorts of things. Um, I think the most important thing that I can do and that the Herald Sun can do is just ensure that we don't victim blame. That's the thing that we have to be most vigilant about. Um, and, and with Jill Ma was a perfect example of that. I didn't hear anyone saying, what was she doing out at that mm. time of the night? I did. Like, okay, well, you know, 20 years ago, it was the first question the media asked. It was mm. dreadful. Um, I thought, certainly what the Herald Sun did, we focused on the failings in the justice system that allowed this man to be there. Mm. Um, it, there were outrageous failings that, that failed that young woman. Mm. Um, and, and so I think that's the area that we speak to, we speak very much to the middle at the Herald Sun. We have a lot of people that we have to talk, we have to talk with. Mm. Um, I can't alienate 50% um, of those people. So I, I need to talk to those people, not at them. And we just have to ensure that we're not victim blaming. Yeah, I can, I, I get that. Um, but there is a more difficult question there, isn't there? I mean, given it's gender political, and given the commitment, and I think it's undoubted the commitment of the Herald Sun to this issue, how does that reflect on the rest of the paper? Would you still run a sexist joke? Would you still run um, comments on the comment streams of some of your columnists and so on, which are demeaning to women? Or do you see that as somehow a separate issue and not covered by this one? Well, Margaret and I could argue about this till the end of time. We and, could, and, 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 and have. And, and <laughs> in fact, we do. Um, free speech versus... Um, uh, mm. what our responsibility is on this. It's a really hard one. You know, um, we've, we've prominently reported today that a V8 driver has been fined $25,000 for um, just saying something so offensive and stupid. We took Billy Brownless to task over something really stupid he said the other day that he then dismissed as, as um, oh, just a throwaway line. Well, no, it wasn't actually. <laughs> mm. um, so, you know, I'd argue that we do advocate for this, um, mm. but I, I'm not going to agree with you that we should limit the comments um, that come out as a result of some of the things that our opinion writers do, because I think that's a free speech issue and it's a different issue, I, I would, think. Would you have the same attitude on issues of race? Yeah, I would. You would? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, Jane, do you want to comment on this? How do you cover gender politics? Um, I think it's the one area that the media significantly falls down on and it's an insidious thing. It's not so much that you have a headline saying woman got herself killed anymore, but... Um, what we see constantly is the victims being highlighted and the perpetrators disappearing. So in a headline, um, there was one the other day about um, woman takes selfie and leads to murder. Well, no, selfies don't cause murder. Mm. The decision of the man to pick up a knife and stab her was what caused the murder. Um, in the rest of the article, the way it was reported, um, the reporter went and asked a neighbour who reported that they seemed so happy together as if somehow this makes it okay that it, it, he just snapped. She pushed him into it. It's a very insidious form of victim blaming where we're concentrating on the victims and removing the perpetrators from the picture. Even the term violence against women, I think, does that. When you're talking about violence against women, what violence, who's calling that, causing that violence? So I always refer to it as male violence against women because that is actually naming the problem for what it is. And I think this is something that happens all the time in media reporting the perpetrators erased. We focus on the victim, we focus on what she was wearing, what she was doing, what was the cause of the fight, did she leave him, was she having an affair, was there money problems, and we never talk about the actual source of the problem, which was why did a man choose to pick up a knife and stab her? That's the question that we need to be asking that seems to be almost never asked. Mm. And why is it? I mean, again, the statistics, and you've written on this, Jane, show that um, violence is overwhelmingly perpetrated mm -hmm. by men, including male violence on Again, other men. Uh, yeah. yeah. Why? Why is this? That's where you get into really complex that we haven't got enough time to cover here because mm. there isn't a single answer. There's yeah. not, firstly, there's not a single form of violence, even in the domestic violence. It's on a continuum, so you might have some relationships where both people in the relationship are violent towards each other and it's damaging and nasty and certainly terrible for children involved, but it's a very different thing to the sort of intimate terrorism where you have one person 
controlled and terrified and another person exerting control and terror over them. That doesn't always necessarily have to be physically violent. Sometimes that can be very, very quiet. Mm. So again, what you're talking about with this most of the time is that intimate terrorism is almost always men. And again, what you're looking at there, the causes of that is very different to the, the violent couple that throw plates at each other all the time, mm. which is very different to the guy that spikes somebody's drink or that doesn't take no for an answer or that gets into a fight with a woman at the football and punches her. The causes are very different. And I think to ask mm. what's the cause of this, there are so many complex interacting factors mm. that operate particularly on men to make them the perpetrators and operate particularly on women to make them vulnerable to being victims. Yeah. Now, Jane, when you've raised these sorts of issues, particularly how we refer to violence against women or men's violence against women, <coughs> you've paid a price for that, haven't you, <laughs> in terms of uh, the response? T yes. Just tell us a little bit about that. Um, I find it quite weird, actually, because when I talk about this, my assumption is if I'm talking about men who commit violence, I'm talking about violent men. And the reaction that I get from men is so defensive. And I think, but if you're not a violent man, I'm not talking about you. Why are you so defensive about this? Perhaps you should think about that. But also, they seem to think that if you say that men are violent, you are saying, you know, it's like the internet, and not all men. Anytime mm -hmm. you mention it, some man pops up out of the internet screaming about not all men. And I think, you're the one saying all men, not me. I'm supposed to be the rabid feminist and I'm the one saying, well, men should be better than this and I don't think all men are like this. And you're the one defending men's rights telling me that all you're, I'm saying all men are violent. It's, it's this really weird reaction I have never understood. And the other one that I think is hilarious is stop saying all men are violent. I don't know if I can use the words that they normally use, but or I will kill you. Mm. right <laughs> then. <laughs> Good point, well made. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, has the Herald Sun had any flavour of that sort of response? Oh, I certainly get it. Mm -hmm. um, I get it very personally. I block people on Twitter so they find me on email, um, of course. Um, mm. th there is a group of people out there, a group of, well, I imagine they're men, they're, the names they use on Twitter and in emails mm. seem, seem to be men, who react so violently to, to this suggestion. And like I say, it's, we try really hard to bring people with us on on this, um, to engage people. I, I, don't, I don't want my coverage in the Herald Sun to, to have people going, oh, that doesn't apply to me, and just turn the page. I need mm. them to read it. Um, but still, even when I write in, in that kind of a way, people react so furiously to it. And we are not suggesting all men are violent. They're not. Mm. Um, but the, the same experience, that um, mm. there are some people who just react um, so incredibly badly to it. I can't imagine how they deal with the women around them in their day-to-day -day life. Yes, I can. It's interesting, isn't it? Actually, um, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> now we're going to go to questions in about five minutes, but before we do that, obviously there's been this enormous increase in quantum. I think it's inarguable that there's been an increase in the coverage of it as a social issue, and perhaps we're even begin beginning to get to grips with the gender politics. Although I would argue that that's a gap. What are the other gaps? What still needs to happen, Vanessa? Where do we need to go from here? <laughs> I, w I wouldn't say that that's separate to what you've raised. I, I think we need to discuss this as a social issue and people need to understand how to grapple, I suppose, a at a sophisticated level with how this plays out and what we do. So fundamentally, to me, there's no point in discussing something if people don't know what to do and if we're not going to do something about it. Otherwise, it's just it's depressing and horrible and it doesn't actually help anybody. So I would be against things that are purely awareness raising or incident reporting. So in terms of how you do that, you report an incident, obviously, or a person's story because that's news. You link it into the broader issue. So that's about putting commentary about what those causes are. And that doesn't always have to be... Um, you know, in the flesh interviews. It can be comments from the UN. It can be comments from Vic Health. Vic Health have done very significant research in Victoria on this, mm. and it's very leading research uh, in prevention. So it's prevention is about looking at gender inequality and structures and balancing with that violence supportive attitudes more broadly in the community. So it's about violence and it's about gender. It's about them together. And we just... I know that there is a lot of missing data, but there's also some very clear data, and I think we need to start acknowledging that instead of going, oh, there's grey areas here. Where, where aren't the grey areas? We do have some quite concrete 
um, leads on where this goes. Vic Health has got very clear research that says that the key drivers of this are about gender inequality and are about gender inequitable attitudes and behaviours. So men may be suffering all kinds of mental illness or extreme circumstances if they do not believe that they are entitled to take that out on women in their lives, in their families or in the community, that violence won't exist. So gendered violence, regardless of other influencing or risk factors, requires that gender inequality to happen. And that is not just on a personal level. We're talking about structural, and that's where, when I brought up before, we need to talk about all the factors of women's lives. When we say gender is a key driver, that does not mean that women are not impacted in that in different ways, depending on their circumstances. The way that women with disabilities are targeted and the way that their disabilities are targeted because people see that as a way to control them. Men see that as a way to control them. So it's very important to look at how these intersect and I don't think the media's grasped that. We've seen a few articles recently that have said, this isn't all about gender, it's actually socioeconomic because it happens more in Dandenong. That to me is not a fair balance of evidence. There are, there are reasons why, like Jane mentioned, there are particular reporting. Looking at police statistics of who reports it, if you're in you know, housing that's very close, people are gonna call the police on you far more than if you're in Turak and you have a kilometre of grass around your house. That does not necessarily mean that violence is happening more. In communities where violence is more accepted, there is more violence supportive attitudes, violence is more likely to be physical and to be more extreme, or when there's alcohol involved, to be more extreme. That doesn't mean that violence is not happening where it's not physical, where people can't see it, where people aren't hearing it. So we need a nuanced discussion of those reporting rates, the police rates, the ABS. And yeah, <laughs> not a short answer, Margaret, I'm sorry, but well, that is the focus. So let's talk about what we know and stop going, oh, there's all these technicalities around the border. Actually, let's start from what we know, at least get the community to be aware of that. And then we can talk about, oh, if, if a woman's pushed out of her wheelchair, is it because she's in Dandenong? Is it because she's female? Is it because she's in a wheelchair? Is it because she's wearing a hijab? Obviously, life is complicated and there's a lot of social factors interacting, but gender is that key driver and is the commonality between all them. So let's talk about that. I was just reflecting the other day with all the reporting about... <laughs> <laughs> and all my P4 colleagues as well, who do fabulous work in this area. I was reflecting the other day with all the reporting about the way surgeons have been behaving in the workplace. One wonders how they behave at home, which certainly probably wouldn't be in Dandenong. But um, Ellen, uh, what are the gaps? What needs to happen that isn't happening in this area? Um, I don't think we've got our heads around what's um, happening broadly in um, culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Uh, disability is another area that we can do more on. Indigenous communities, we, um, you know, we're not even close to unpicking that. Um, so I, I think there are a lot more areas. There, there is still uh, more to be done in terms of how we scrutinise the justice system. Um, the, the catastrophic failings that we see that result in a person's death, and I know Vanessa will say I'm obsessing about one end of it, but this is the, mm -hmm. the very visible end of yeah. it, I suppose. Um, there are still so many failings in the justice system. I see that very much as an area that the Herald Sun can have some influence on mm. um, because they're the kind of areas that a, um, politicians will react to. Um, so I, I, I see a number of areas where we can continue to work and, and grow, and, and certainly our campaign needs to diversify into other areas too. Yes. Jane, what are the gaps? Uh, I think, in addition to everything that's just been said, I think the other one is the political one, because one of the basic things that we're lacking is funding for the frontline services, mm -hmm. for community legal funds, for women's refuges, mm -hmm. where they're turning away hundreds and thousands of women every year, and this is just about money, and money is the easiest thing to fix of all of these. Of all of these terrible, complex, difficult things we're talking about here, the one that you can just fix by money, that's so easy. The rest of it is the really difficult stuff, so if we could just start with that, which comes really, I think, from what we've had over the last few years, certainly in the federal area, is politicians who didn't think it was a priority. Mm. And I think we need to make that message really, really clear to federal politicians that yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, incredibly interesting discussion. Um, Sorry, I'm not, I'm not hearing that. Can, can everyone hear me? Should I stand up or...? 
No, I don't think that will make any difference. That's better, I think. Okay, I'll yeah. stand up mm -hmm. um, to make it all more embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I, I was wondering about um, the gap with um, the LGBTI com community and violence, particularly against trans women. Um, there was an appalling Korea Mail headline. I don't know if everyone remembers. It was Monster Chef and the She Mail, and it had a big picture of a woman in a bikini, and she'd actually been murdered by her partner. So there was a lot of outcry about that. I mean, it was just unbelievably shocking. And I'm just wondering, as other members of the media, how do you kind of hold your colleagues to account on those sorts of things? How, do you, how does the media report on the media when it does things like that? Um, and particularly, I think, in relation to the trans community, which is one of the most vulnerable communities out there. I'll throw to you first on that, Helen. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll I'm, I, well, yeah, that, that was a, uh, uh, the story that was published in Brisbane. Um, that was adjudicated through the Press Council, I understand, mm -hmm. and they um, were criticised by the Press Council and accepted that criticism. They also issued an apology for that um, story and you won't get me or anyone else defending that story. So I'm not going to sit here and defend it and the, and the treatment of that. And certainly when they revisited that issue um, afterwards they handled it much better but of course the, um, the damage had been done early on. Uh, I have to say the Herald Sun doesn't do uh, many stories in that field at all. Uh, the Age does a little bit. Um, I'm not really sure why that is. Uh, we just haven't. Um, we're not opposed to it. Um, we just haven't, and it, it is an area perhaps that we should be looking at. Jane? Um, you're absolutely right. The trans community particularly are vulnerable to violence, and I think they experience it at something like four times the rate of um, cis women. So this is something that, that we do need to talk about more. I think part of it with the mainstream is that the trans community is very small, and the mainstream media is talking to the mainstream. So they see it sort of as a niche, whereas those of us in niche publications know that, that we can talk to them more easily. But like all the other things that we're talking about, it's a, an awareness thing. So as much as it's taken the last few years to raise awareness about male violence against women, we're now in the process of raising awareness about violence against trans women, against the, the full LGBTI community. And I think that's just a process that we're going through. I think it started. It's got a ways to go, but it is definitely underway. Yeah. Vanessa? I, this reflects the fact that I work in this area all the time. I was very excited by the response to those reports because I look at articles that are as bad as that quite regularly. The Australian Press Council that Ellen's mentioned, who basically adjudicate and, and tell people off and, <laughs> and stuff like that when they do things wrong. They got more complaints on that than I think anything else that they'd gotten that year or what. It was an amazing amount. So I think that shows a real shift. It's not enough and I'm not saying that it is. How do you hold people to account? I think it is the community caring and that's what made me excited about that reporting is the community actually cared. They went, this is not on. We don't want to talk about people like this and it is not okay to talk about victims like this. And I, th I think that's astounding because it's definitely been an area that is not <coughs> violence against women more broadly. Issues of violence within the LGBT community more broadly is very infrequently talked about. In terms of how we want to talk about it, I think again it's about contextualising it going, this is about the LGBT community, but it's also broadly about how we look at violence, who is a, uh, a victim that we have sympathy for and who is a victim that we don't have sympathy for and how does that direct the ways that we talk. And that is a really broad issue. So I think you can link it into that even with a mainstream audience and say, this is an example of this bigger issue, which is of relevance to everybody. Mm, that's really interesting. We'll have the second question. Hi, I'm Scott Holmes. I'm a prevention practitioner. Um, I've been working in this space now for nearly five years and I look around here and the ratio of men to women is about the same as it was when I began five years ago. I'm wondering about the, uh, the comment that was made about having to speak with 50% of the population, not at them. I'm not sure that that's actually achieving much change in terms of getting actually men actually involved in this issue. I'm wondering what we can do to actually be, be, uh, find other ways to say, men, you've got to step up and actually come to events like this. Mm. That's a, a good question. <laughs> Who wants to tackle that one? Um, well, I'll start because I think, um, while well, you're right, I'm looking out and seeing a lot of female faces and not very many male faces. I do think men are talking more about the need to step up, that 
although white ri ribbon have had all kinds of issues, they are making that idea public that um, in recent years there are, I don't know much about sport ball, but there's been football players and rugby players, I think, speaking publicly about this in ways that we would never have heard of 10 years ago. It just, they would have been pilloried if they tried it. So I think, again, it is changing, but you're talking about social change which happens slowly. It happens at tragically, painfully slowly rate. Mm. But it is slowly, slowly moving, and those things that I'm seeing in the last couple of years are an indication that men are aware that they need to become involved in this. It's still got, again, still got a ways to go, but I do think it is changing. Mm. Addressing this in an indirect way, I don't want to sound like a politician, but tw 20 years ago, when I was a crime reporter, in the early, I suppose, it, more the early 90s, um, uh, systemic sex abuse was just becoming a story and um, people were speaking out for the first time really in, in huge numbers about being abused through the churches and the community groups and no one knew how to deal with it. The police didn't know how to deal with it. In the media we didn't know how to deal with it. You get a complaint against a person that, that the police had finally forced themselves to investigate and would result in charges being laid against someone who was a pillar of the community, a male pillar of the community. No, like it was, how do we report it? This is so grubby, do we actually report it? Are people ready for this? Um, we tied ourselves in knots. Now we don't, it's really simple now. Um, we just report it. The, the people feel, people who have been victimised feel very comfortable coming forward and holding the people who did that to account. The courts know how to deal with it, police know how to deal with it, the media does. Um, I would like to think that where we are now is the start of that process on violence against women and family violence. So I think we're at the start of it. I really, really hope that um, in a couple of years we're going to be right where we are now with, with not finding it hard and not having to overthink how we deal with people who perpetrate violence against others. Mm. Vanessa, would you like to have a go? How do you get men involved in issues of this oh. kind? Look, I don't have the answer to that. I've got a couple of ideas in terms of the broader issue. I know um, there's been some really good papers um, on not using masculinity to get men involved, and I think that's what we need to think about. Um, you what, know, what, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, there's a lot of uh, this is what men respond to, so this is how we'll phrase it. You know, men respond to their other peers, so we have to have male peers talking to them about that and holding them accountable. And whilst that's true, we also need to be investigating why women's voices do not have the same power um, in influencing men and the fact that that's problematic and not just accepting it. We also need to look at the sort of dialogues around, you know, real men don't do this, real men don't rape, real men don't whatever, and look at the fact that we're reinforcing this concept of real men, which is, I mean, to me, nothing else except hyper-masculine. And so I think that's something we need to investigate. And also this, this concept of men as saviours. And that's part of that real men thing, as though it's some sort of a, a, a real stance and an extraordinary quality to stand against violence against women. It, it feels like I'm being done a favour by a, a superman, you know, rather than going, it is my right to not be abused by someone and just any man, you don't have to be real, you can be <laughs> fake if you like, could do something about it. So I think it's about how we do that. And I do also think sometimes men feel they need permission to get involved. And that's what I've seen recently in male journalists and men in the community. And whilst it's not great, I do think it's rising. And I think that is also about um, men that are interested in this going, I'm not actually stamping on women's toes by getting involved because you don't want to be that overpowering voice that speaks over women either. So I do think that it's about how men get involved in this without feeling like they're dominating or taking over. And so it's, again, it's about that nuance of, of roles and people and responsibilities and how we work together yeah. on it. I might just add a little bit to that because it's certainly notable to me. I've chaired a few sessions uh, over these days of talking about media and it really is notable looking out at all of you <laughs> um, that the gender balance at this session is quite different from any other session we've had at the New News. Um, and that's, yeah, I mean, not that you're all not all welcome, of course, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame that there aren't more men here. But it's not only an event like this, which, of course, has been publicly advertised through the Wheeler Centre website and through our website and, and through social media and so on. 
Um, at the university, I'm part of a group of researchers that gather around the Melbourne Social Equity Institute, which looks at research on social equity across a, a very broad range, not only this issue, but including this issue. And again and again, when they call their morning teas or call seminars of researchers in the area, it's all women on social equity generally. Why is this? I don't know, but it's a bit depressing. <laughs> um, so I really don't know. But anyway, let's take another question. No other questions? Yes, OK. We have two at the front, towards the front here. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering what the panel thought about compulsory reporting by medical practitioners. And, um, of course, there's an argument against that, that this will deter women from seeking medical attention. Yes. Okay, Vanessa, that's your prob <laughs> probably naturally yes. yours. There's, there's a lot of issues around mandatory reporting, not just of, of medical professionals. We saw uh, a few years ago the government looking at bringing in, um, you know, sort of punitive measures against parents or arguably just women for not reporting abuse against their children. I think we very strongly as a peak body try and work from an evidence base rather than an ideas base. So I think a lot of people in the community have got ideas about how we fix this. I think we need to look at evidence solutions. And as you said, there, there's a lot of problems with forced reporting. And it, it to me falls a little bit into a very sort of law and order approach. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, order has no place in this, but we do need to look at not just punitive measures and not just forcing things, but cultural change. And I think it can sometimes seem easier to just go punish people, they have to report it and punish them, without looking at the ramifications of what that means for women having access to health services and being able to be honest and open with them without this person then taking over their life. It can be quite risky for women to report. There can be ramifications for them. So if, if they are then punished, they can. if men are then punished, they can then punish their families for that. It's a complicated situation. And it's not this just charge in and rescue the princess from the tower and everything will be okay and lock up the, the evil ogre. People need to have a more nuanced understanding of how you fix this problem. And that is about community change, not just lock people up, punish this person. So yeah, I, would, I mean, I could talk for hours about the problems with that process, but it sounds like you know them. And yeah, I would support it. Uh, it do I? Sorry, I, I just thought you were thinking. Sorry, I wasn't um, Thinking about it from a punitive aspect, um, I was just interested about um, how you talked previously about Christine Nixon just changing how things were reported in um, in the police realm. Mm. Um, and we are we almost out of time, so I'd just Sorry. ask you to bring it to a question really quickly if, yeah. if you want to. Okay, yeah, just mm. um, can, can we have sort of more realistic data from reporting, but not necessarily with a punitive Police reporting, aspect. right, okay. Yep. To, well, to quote Tony Jones, I'm going to take that as a comment. There was just one more person who had their hand up. If you could just make it a quick question and quick responses, and then I'm going to have to wrap it up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say it seems that there's a real variance in how a lot of the uh, murders are reported. I'm thinking about about, um, if a woman is young, attractive, and she's murdered by a stranger, it gets a lot more coverage. Yeah. Mm. Ellen, would you would like to comment on that? Um, I think think that has been the case over the years that a, a stranger murder, um, and I think I think the background to that is because it can't, everyone could relate to it because we've all walked down the street, so it could have happened to any of us. What that failed to take into account, of course, is that family violence was happening to, you know or a lot of people, um, but because we weren't reporting that, there was no broader understanding of that. And I think if you look at some of the cases that we've had uh, very prominently displayed in the Herald Sun, of course, um, Luke, Luke Batty killed by his father being an example of that, even before Rosie, of course, became Australian of the Year, but even before that, that, that was given uh, very extensive coverage. Yes. Um, Just quickly, Jane. <laughs> very quickly. I think also part of it plays into the male idea of denying that they are perpetrators. If it's the freak lightning strike guy, then that's not, he's not a guy like us, mm. he's a monster. He's yeah. not just a real man, he's not the, the man we sit next to on the train every day. And really most of the violence is perpetrated by the guy sitting next to you on the train. Yeah. And I think mm. it's part of the, the male desire to erase that from reality. Yeah. 
OK, well, look, I'm afraid we do have to wrap it up there, not because we couldn't keep talking about it all day and arguably should keep talking about it all day. We will be talking about this issue again next year at the New News, and it will be interesting to see, to look back and compare and contrast about where we are and the extent to which reporting has changed or not over that time. Thank you. Thank you.